So our first speaker is Tony Hunter, who would have been the other half of the Tonys. And um, so Tony um, was educated at Cambridge. And after obtaining his PhD, came to the Salk Institute, went to the Salk Institute to work with uh, Walter Eckhart. He returned back to England for a short period of time before taking his uh, faculty position at the Salk, where he's been uh, ever since. Uh, by now, he's uh, American Cancer Society professor and the holder of the Del Becco chair. Um, Tony has so many awards that you have to shrink the font and uh, make it almost uh, impossible to read. Um, but most notable, or least notable, noticeable, are things such as the Horowitz Prize and the Wolf Prize uh, a few years ago. So he's going to talk to us about signal transduction through post-translational modifications of proteins. So it's the molecular uh, end of uh, signal transduction. So, Tony. Good mic there. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jerry, for that oh. very kind introduction. Um, okay. Starting early. No. Okay. Should I tell you a story? No. <laughs> Actually, I will tell you that um, it's. it's um, it's a pleasure to be back here. The last time I was here was in uh, 1989, so a long time ago now. But the first time I was here was in uh, 1972 for a Steenbock meeting, uh, July 10th through 12th, 1972. And the morning of uh, July the 12th was the last time I shaved. <laughs> uh, I left from the meeting to um, fly to Las Vegas and then to Grand Canyon Village and hiked down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon where I joined a rafting trip that was being run by a graduate student at the Salk Institute. And by the end of the trip, which was 14 days later, I had a healthy beard and I have never looked back. Of course, it was, it was darker then. so. Okay, well, it's a great pleasure to, um, to be here to open the seventh annual Oliver Smithies Symposium. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have, to have met Oliver. I can't remember exactly when the first time we met. It might have been when he was interested in uh, DNA sequence analysis in the 80s when we were interested in beginning to define the large family of, uh, of protein kinases. Um, we were lucky enough. Can we have the, the lights down now on the, on the front? Uh, on the screen. Um, I was lucky enough to be one of the um, awardees of the General Motors Cancer Research uh, Foundation prizes in, in 1994. And um, Oliver Smithies here and um, Mario Capecchi shared uh, the Sloan Prize uh, that year. And we, ah, that's great. Thank you. And um, we had a very nice uh, celebration in, in Washington, and uh, Oliver was in, was in good form. So I want to begin then with some sort of general remarks about post-translational modification as a means for regulating uh, protein function and activity. So PTMs, as uh, we often call them, um, occur commonly in unstructured regions of proteins, so in, in linkers between domains or in, in terminal tails. Um, and a significant fraction of post-translational modifications are reversible. So in this case, a, a phosphate can be added 
to a particular residue in the protein and then uh, taken off again. And two of the most common types of uh, PTM are phosphorylation and ubiquitylation. In each case, there is an enzyme or family of enzymes that is used to modify the protein, in this case using ATP uh, to donate a phosphate to a serine, threonine, or tyrosine in a protein, um, being a large family of protein kinases that I'll review in a minute. And there's a second class of enzyme, in this case the protein phosphatases, which removes the phosphate from the protein, reverting it back to its uh, original state. And phosphorylation of proteins can regulate their activity in a variety of ways, uh, through steric effects or electrostatic effects, or perhaps most importantly, through inducing protein-protein interaction. Uh, ubiquitylation again, utilizes a family of uh, ubiquitin ligases uh, that take activated ubiquitin on an E2 enzyme and uh, donate the ubiquitin to a protein generally on a lysine or N-terminal residue. Again, this, this modification can be uh, removed by another class of enzymes, the deubiquitinating enzymes or, or DUBs. So over 350 different post-translational modifications are known. Um, this number seems to be increasing, uh, largely through the advent of, uh, of mass spec analysis. Uh, of these, phosphorylation is, is the most prevalent, um, with thousands of occupied sites in a single cell, um, although ubiquitylation appears to be catching up fast. So the mammalian genome has a relatively small number of genes, around 20,000 genes which is large in some sense, but small considering the complexity of the mammalian um, body plan and the functions it can carry out. Now those 20,000 genes can produce maybe 100,000 different transcripts through alternative splicing, differential uh, initiation and polyadenylation. So you could make in principle 100,000 different proteins. Even that may not be enough and Post-translational modifications can increase the proteome complexity enormously, um, perhaps given more than a million different types of protein molecule in a cell. So this probably is sufficiently complex then to carry out um, all the necessary functions. So in, in terms of numbers, the, the Cell Signaling Phosphocyte Plus database has uh, over 200,000 different mapped serine, threonine, and tyrosine phosphorylation sites. And Matthias Mann's group in unpublished data has identified 40,000 sites in, in a HeLa cell. So that means that every protein in the cell, there are about 10,000 different expressed proteins in a HeLa cell, is modified at four, on average, four sites. The site has 51,000 ubiquitylation sites and 24,000 acetylation sites. So you can see how common post-translational modifications are. And one of the challenges we face is to try and figure out which of these sites actually is functionally relevant. Just because it can be detected, it doesn't mean to say that it's actually doing anything for the cell. It could be neutral. So as I said, new post-translational modifications are still being identified. Um, here are some, a few types of modification that have been reported in the last five years or so, such as ampelation or adenylation of threonine and tyrosine, um, et cetera. And in addition, an emerging theme is that post-translational modifications can compete for a single site in the protein. So we know that serine and threonine can be modified by several different types of group. And these, in principle, can compete with one another. Uh, for instance, there is uh, reasonable evidence that phosphorylation and ogluknaculation, a, a single sugar modification, can compete at specific sites. The issue here always is whether the stoichiometry of modification is high enough for any one type of PTM to really compete for a second type of PTM. But certainly, in principle, this is a, a possibility. Now, nine out of the 20 amino acids can be phosphorylated. We all focus on serine, threonine, and tyrosine. But the three basic amino acids can be phosphorylated, and I'll be talking about histidine phosphorylation, cysteine, and the two acidic amino acids. So nine out of the 20 can be modified. And we know very little about phosphorylation uh, other than 
phosphorylation of serine, threonine, and tyrosine. So one of the um, most important functions of uh, post translational modification is to serve as a means of inducing protein-protein interaction through um, binding domains that recognize the modified residue usually in conjunction with sequence around that modified residue. So for instance, uh, phosphotyrosine residues can be recognized by proteins that contain SH2 domains. Um, phosphothreonine by proteins that contain an FHA domain. This is also true for ubiquitin residues and for sumo residues, and I'll be talking about the sumo-sim interaction uh, towards the end of my talk, and uh, methylated and acetylated lysine. This is particularly important in uh, chromatin uh, regulation. So at this point, I would like also to pay tribute to uh, Tony Pawson, who really uh, popularized the idea that um, phosphorylation of tyrosine can be recognized by a discrete domain, the SH2 domain, and then went on and developed that theme um, into a general model in which uh, small modular binding domains recognize specific post-translational marks to set up signaling networks. This is a picture of Tony and I. I think it was in 2010 in, in Dubrovnik on the city walls. So I already told you then that uh, there is a large family of uh, protein kinases. When the, um, did I skip? No, I didn't. Okay. When um, the human genome sequence was completed in 2002, uh, Gerard Manning and the group at uh, Sujen and I uh, defined the complement of protein kinase genes in the, in the human genome. And at that time, we found 518 uh, protein kinase uh, genes, of which 478 were all in a single uh, unrooted branch tree with seven major branches. Um, for instance, the AGC branch is the uh, cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase branch. And the TK branch, these are the tyrosine kinases. Uh, since that time, um, there have been a number of new protein kinase um, genes that have been added. Uh, our current count, and this is again the work of Gerard Manning, is that there are 48 new um, uh, remote and atypical protein kinases. So these are protein kinases that do not belong to that single tree but uh, form other small families. And among these will be, for instance, FAM20C, which is a protein kinase localized in the lumen of the Golgi. And this is the kinase that actually phosphorylates casein, and not the casein kinase 1 and 2 that you may know that are intracellular enzymes and certainly do not phosphorylate casein. There were 90 tyrosine kinases in our original kinome, and the number has not increased. So we did a good job of finding tyrosine kinases early on. Uh, although pyruvate kinase M2 has been reported um, as a, uh, a tyrosine threonine dual specificity protein kinase. So this is a, a metabolic enzyme moonlighting as a protein kinase. Perhaps not surprisingly, given the importance of protein phosphorylation in regulating cellular functions, um, perturbation in phosphorylation are the cause of human disease. And out of the 566, over 175 and probably more have been implicated in human disease, particularly in cancer, through mutations, uh, gain of function or loss of function mutations, or changes in level of expression. And so this pie chart here shows you that there are at least 140 protein kinases implicated in cancer, um, and probably more will emerge as cancer genome sequencing proceeds. 
the importance particularly of tyrosine kinases, in, uh, misregulated or upregulated tyrosine kinases in cancer led to intensive efforts by the pharmaceutical industry to uh, develop inhibitors. Uh, and starting with Gleevec in uh, 2001, which inhibits BCR ABLE, the driver of chronic myelogenous leukemia. Um, 20 tyrosine kinases have now been approved as cancer drugs, and uh, there are 26 protein kinase inhibitors overall um, approved as uh, cancer drugs. So the tyrosine kinase branch of the tree I showed you uh, with its 90 tyrosine kinases, the largest family um, is the EPH family of receptor tyrosine kinases. Many of these are in, implicated in cancer. And uh, this just reiterates what I told you is that um, this has been a major target for drug development in cancer. And in addition to the, uh, to the 20 that have been approved, there are at least another 20 in clinical trials. And so the number of tyrosine kinase inhibitor drugs will certainly increase. And this is an up-to-date table of, of the kinase inhibitors, the small molecule kinase inhibitors that have been approved. Uh, um, Seritinib here was approved only last week. And I think by this time next year, I can't get them all onto to one slide. So the emphasis in uh, studying phosphorylation, as I've already implied, has been on kinases that phosphorylate serine, threonine, and tyrosine. Um, and by far the majority of uh, phosphorylation sites that have been identified are serine, threonine, or tyrosine sites, particularly in mammalian cells. This is in part because the um, phosphate ester that these hydroxy amino acids form is incredibly stable under normal conditions. So the half-life of a, a, say, a serine phosphate ester is about 1,000 years in water at pH 7. So it's an incredibly stable bond. But of course, in the cell, it's not stable because of the large family of uh, protein phosphatases. As I indicated, uh, six other amino acids can be phosphorylated, and we know very little about either the identities of the protein kinases or the functions of these phosphorylations. So among the, the 14 new atypical protein kinases are members of this uh, NDPK and M23 NME family, which Ed Skolnick has reported can phosphorylate histidine. So these are putative protein histidine kinases. And we've been interested in the possibility that histidine phosphorylation may play an important role in cell physiology for many years. Um, shortly after uh, tyrosine phosphorylation was discovered, we realized that histidine phosphorylation might play a similar role and try to generate antibodies to phosphohistidine, and that was back in the early 1980s, um, but failed. But I will tell you in the next few slides how we finally have been successful in making antibodies against phosphohistidine for use in studying um, histidine phosphorylation. So just to remind those of you who are biochemically challenged uh, in the audience, uh, this is the structure of tyrosine. It's a phenolic ring here, and it's phosphorylated by uh, creating a phosphate ester with the O4 hydroxyl group. Very stable linkage. This is the structure of uh, histidine. This is the imidazole ring with its two nitrogens, which are not symmetrical. And histidine can be phosphorylated either at the N1 position or um, the N3 position. So you form two isoforms of phosphohistidine. These are phosphoramidate linkages. So these are inherently much less stable, particularly under acid conditions. And that actually causes problems when trying to study histidine phosphorylation. So phosphohistidine was first detected in a bacterial protein in, in 1962, so just over 50 years ago now, by Paul, Bo Paul Boyer's group, who identified, as you can see, phosphohistidine um, as a probable inter intermediate in oxidative phosphorylation. Turns out this was in 
succinate thiokinase, phosphohistidine is an enzyme intermediate. And subsequently, it's been well documented that um, histidine phosphorylation occurs in bacterial two-component systems, in which a sensor protein, generally a transmembrane protein, is activated as a histidine kinase, autokinase, by some external signal. And then that phosphate on the phosphohistidine in the sensor protein is transferred onto an aspartate. So this is another type of phosphorylation in a, a response regulator protein, often a DNA uh, binding transcription factor. So although people call these proteins histidine kinases, they're really aspartate kinases, not histidine kinases. But phosphohistidine is also known in eukaryotes. There are several metabolic enzymes that use phosphohistidine as, a, uh, as an intermediate phosphoglycerate mutase, succinyl-CoA synthase, succinate thiokinase, um, ATP citrate lyase. But there's evidence that phosphohistidine is present in other proteins in cells. So these are the two isoforms of phosphohistidine, their structures, the 1p-his and the 3p-his. And as I said, uh, the phosphate, the phosphoramidate linkage is rather unstable, particularly at acid pH. So any pH below 7, and certainly upon um, heating. So as an example of what a phosphohistidine in a protein looks like, there are actually several structures, and this is the structure of a, one of these bacterial histidine kinase sensor proteins. And you can see that it autophosphorylates in response to a signal on a histidine, in this case forming three phosphohistidine, as you can see from this crystal structure. Interestingly, this is on a, a helix in a rather flat surface, so it's sort of not typically what you might think of as an enzyme catalytic site. Now, a number of proteins have been reported to be histidine phosphorylated over, over the years. Um, Two recent reports from Ed Skolnick's group at NYU have uh, indicated that histidines in the C-terminal tails of different ion channels can be phosphorylated, possibly by um, NME family kinases. And by mutation, um, they have deduced that these phosphorylations regulate channel activity. The beta subunit of G proteins. And interestingly, histone H4 phosphorylated at histidine 18. This is a phosphorylation that's conserved in all eukaryotes, from yeast to uh, mammals. But no one really has any idea what it does. So the only putative histidine kinases then are these, this family of um, proteins. They were first identified as nucleoside diphosphate kinases, so they're used to regenerate uh, nucleoside diphosphates into the triphosphate form, for instance, GDP to GTP using ATP as a phosphate donor. Um, they actually work through an autophosphorylation reaction, which generates a phosphohistidine, and that phosphate is then transferred onto the nucleoside diphosphate. But uh, there's evidence that these enzymes, and there's a family of 10 of them, actually probably do other things. And uh, interestingly, NME1 was the first metastasis or putative metastasis suppressor gene that was identified because its expression level is extremely low in metastatic melanoma cell lines. There's also a, a protein, a phosphohist phosphohistidine protein phosphatase, PHPT1. It's again a conserved enzyme, just like the uh, NMEs are, and um, it's a small protein. And it has been shown to be able to dephosphorylate um, some specific phosphohistidine proteins, including this potassium channel. So as I've already intimated, uh, we realized that uh, good antibodies against phosphohistidine would be one way to study this process more readily. It's very hard to label cells with P32 and identify phosphohistidine because of its lability. And by analogy with phosphotyrosine, we thought it should be possible then to, to generate antibodies that recognize the two isoforms selectively. And there were hints that this might work because some of the original phosphotyrosine monoclonal antibodies detect phosphohistidine. 
So several groups, including ours, did try to do this 30 years ago without success. And we knew what we needed was a non-cleavable analog of phosphohistidine to immunize with. And luckily for us, two groups, Tom Muir's group, uh, particularly at Rockefeller, um, reported the synthesis of uh, analogs, triazolyl alanine analogs of 1 and 3 p his that could be used as immunogens. And Muir's group actually was able to do this to uh, generate sequence-specific phosphohistidine antibodies against phosphohistidine 18 in H4. So these are what the TZA analogs, PTZA analogs look like, as I will uh, call them. So this is the ring structure. It's a five-membered ring with an extra nitrogen in it. And the phosphate is linked via um, a phosphonate bond, a phosphorus carbon bond to the ring. So this is totally stable to hydrolysis. And overall, the, the general um, structure and the electrostatic potential on the TZAs looks pretty similar to that of the uh, natural phosphohistidine. The synthesis is relatively simple, uh, if you're a chemist, that is. Um, you use click chemistry with two different um, metal catalysts and uh, these two starting materials, and you can generate uh, one and three PTZA. So you can use these now to, to build peptide sequences. And our goal was not to have sequence-specific antibodies, but uh, sequence-independent phosphohistidine antibodies and so based on some earlier work we did with phosphotyrosine antibodies, we decided to, to build these analogs into um, small random glyala peptide backbones and then use these linked to KLH to immunize rabbits. Uh, and then if we were successful in making the polyclonal antibodies, then we would make monoclonal antibodies and ultimately begin to use these to study histidine phosphorylation. So this, this was the uh, immunogen that we devised, uh, either one or three PTZA here. Five residues on either side is glioala randomly. So these are amino acids with small side chains, neutral, probably don't offer much for recognition by the immune system, uh, linked to KLH via an N-terminal uh, cysteine. And the synthesis was of the peptide library was carried out by Jacques Marget and his group at uh, Sanofi in uh, Tucson. Okay, so if we were going to make antibodies, we had to have a way of um, analyzing uh, antibodies. And so we chose to um, characterize the one phosphoantibodies against phosphorylated NME1, which uh, generates a one phosphohistidine intermediate. Here's the structure. The three phosphoantibodies against phosphorylated phosphoglycerate mutase, which uses a phosphohistidine 3 three phosphohistidine intermediate, uh, and there's the structure here. And then to show that the phosphate we were detecting was actually linked to histidine, we've used um, either heating or acid treatment, which should discharge the phosphate. So we were successful, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it. Um, so here's uh, one of our relatively early bleeds of uh, rabbit antiserum against 1-PTZA. And we can detect uh, phosphohistidine containing NME1 uh, down to significant dilutions. And actually, you can see from the blot with the NME1 antibodies that um, the phospho form migrates slightly slower than the unphosphorylated form. So these antibodies work then for immunoblotting. And I'll just show you a, you know, a couple of bits of um, data that we've obtained with these antibodies. So um, for instance, the 1 p his 1 PTZA antibodies detect NME1, but not a 3 phosphohistidine PGAM. Conversely, the 3 phosphohistidine antibodies detect PGAM, but not NME1. And in this case, you can see that um, heating basically dis uh, destroys the signal um, seen with the three phosphohistidine antibodies for phosphoglycerate mutase. So we had the antisera, but we really wanted a renewable uh, reagent resource, and so we uh, contracted with Epitomics to make rabbit monoclonal antibodies. We sent them the rabbit spleens from hyperimmunized animals, and they fused it with their patented um, fusion partner, and um, 
They gave us the clones, the multi-well clones to, to screen. And we have been successful in, in generating uh, three clones, uh, three uh, rabbit monoclonal uh, hybridoma clones for each antigen. And I'll just show you a couple of pieces of data here. So here is blotting of a series of pancreatic cancer cell lines, either with heating or without heating, um, with a, one of the one phosphohistidine monoclonals. And you can see there are several bands. And the major bands are clearly NME1 and NME2 under these conditions. And here are um, some blots with a 3-PTCA monoclonal. E. coli, we see a lot of bands, most of which go away. And uh, we know what some of these are. But there are a lot of proteins here, some of which may be two-component um, histidine kinases. And here is a similar experimentation of 293 cells. Again, a lot of bands, um, most of which go away with heating. So I think we have fairly good reagents. We've done some tests for sequence dependence using uh, PTZA peptides of defined sequence representing known phosphorylation sites. And they are relatively sequence independent in both cases. In terms of, of using these antibodies, we've done a couple of immunofluorescence analyses. Uh, so here are, here's staining of um, HeLa cells with uh, one of the one phosphohistidine monoclonals. And we see a lot of punctate staining in the cytoplasm and this interesting structure here with a high concentration of staining. It looked like it might be a phagosome. Um, an interesting NME2 has been reported to be on the outside of phagosomes. We've tried to confirm this with Anna Zagorska in Greg Lemke's lab. Um, who works on macrophages, and uh, if you allow macrophages to take up dextran uh, beads coupled to a fluorescent uh, dye, you can see a, a bead in a phagosome here, and you can see uh, phosphohistidine staining around that. The, the, the macrophages also take up and, and release some uh, dye, and so we think these are probably staining uh, lysosomes here. And 3-phosphohistidine, this is a very preliminary experiment. Um, we thought it might co-stain with mitochondria. I'm not sure this is the case. We see green phosphohistidine staining for 3-phosphohistidine in a series of cytoplasmic puncta as well as in the, in the nucleus. Uh, we don't really know what these are, but obviously these are interesting things to, uh, to follow up. And then finally, obviously, we're interested in defining a phosphohistidine uh, proteome. And so we've begun to do um, some proteomic analysis by coupling uh, our monoclonal antibodies to protein A beads with uh, DSS cross-linking. We then um, used a denaturing lysis condition in 6 molar urea at pH 10 to stabilize the phosphohistidines, um, diluted this down. And then applied, so far we've only run the one phosphohistidine column, applied this to the column to try and enrich for proteins that contain phosphohistidine, um, eluted with triethylamine, pH 11, to preserve the phosphohistidine, and then subjected these to uh, triptych digestion and LCMSMS analysis done by Aaron Aslanian. And you can't see this, obviously, but there ha have been reports, particularly from uh, the Friedman group, of proteins that contain phosphohistidine. And if you look at the yeses in this column here, um, these are either proteins reported to contain phosphohistidine or those that LAPEC uh, found. You can see we found many of these proteins enriched in our anti-1P his pull down. So obviously the next step then is to try and um, identify the sites of histidine phosphorylation. And for this purpose, we're hooking up with Dave Pagliarini and Josh Kuhn here to try and use a negative ion mode uh, mass spec analysis, which should stabilize the phosphate on the histidine to try and really map sites of phosphorylation and find out how extensive histidine phosphorylation is as a cellular modification. So to summarize then, um, we have been successful in generating monoclonal antibodies for both the one and three phosphohistidine uh, isoforms. Uh, 
They appear to be selective. They don't cross uh, react with the other isoform. And we've begun to do some MS analysis uh, of um, phosphohistidine under conventional conditions. The phosphate linkage is relatively unstable, so we have to develop new methods. Now, Tom Muir's group, who reported the initial um, phosphohistidine analog synthesis, hasn't been standing by idly, and he um, made a, a, a polyclonal rabbit serum against uh, another 3-phosphohistidine analog. And these certainly detect uh, phosphohistidine in proteins, but they cross-react with phosphotyrosine, which is not going to be so useful for mammalian cell analysis. And I think you can sort of see why this is what phosphotyrosine looks like, uh, and this is what 3-phosphohistidine um, would look like. There's clearly some analogy in, in the ring structures here. And I told you earlier on, some of the PTAR monoclonals saw phosphohistidine. So ours luckily do not cross-react with phosphotyrosine. And so now we're in a position to analyze the phosphohistidine uh, proteome, particularly perhaps in the setting of uh, cancer. So there are a number of open questions here which we hope to be able to answer in the next few years with help from our collaborators. How big is the phosphohistidine proteome? Under what conditions does it change? Um, are NME family members really histidine kinases? Are they the only histidine kinases? Um, can we develop phosphohistidine phosphatase inhibitors that might increase the signal for phos phosphohistidine for detection? That's certainly widely used in the phosphotyrosine field. Um, is histidine phosphorylation reversed exclusively, enzymatically, or can it occur spontaneously in the cell? How does one study the function of histidine phosphorylation? To date, people use glutamine to substitute for histidine. It's isosteric with histidine, but it's not charged, so it's not a very good non-phosphorylatable analog. Possibly one can develop unnatural amino acid analogs of phosphohistidine to incorporate into proteins at sites of histidine phosphorylation as a true phosphomimic. And then uh, in an area that would really interest Tony Pawson is um, how would histidine phosphorylation regulate protein activity, and are there selective phosphohistidine binding domains? Um, that's something we're working on uh, at the moment. So in the last 10 minutes or so, um, I want to turn to a, a second topic, um, which allows me to introduce the now emerging principle that uh, crosstalk between different PTMs is, is very common. Um, I already told you that PTMs tend to occur in unstructured regions, and so they tend to be concentrated in loops or uh, tails. And we know now many examples of, of crosstalk between um, different types of PTM. For instance, phosphorylation can often be used to trigger ubiquitylation, creating a phosphodegron that's recognized by an E3 ubiquitin ligase. And I'm going to tell you a short story about the crosstalk between sumoylation and ubiquitylation. Now, crosstalk can either be positive or negative, so modification A could uh, promote modification B, or uh, a modification D could inhibit modification C, so it can be positive or negative. And neighboring PTMs can be used for, um, as a bidentate binding site for proteins with multiple interaction domains, serving as sort of an AND logic gate. So for instance, uh, only if sites A and B are modified with their particular PTMs can another protein with an A, a binding site and a B binding site recognize that. And this is, we now know, to be important in recognition of chromatin modifications. So this is the crosstalk I'm going to tell you about. Um, Ubiquitin and SUMO are both small protein adducts that modify the epsilon and minor group of lysine. And in particular, SUMO uh, is added to proteins using um, a three-enzyme cascade in which SUMO is activated uh, by E1 and then E2, and then an E3 is used to help transfer SUMO onto the substrate to form either monoadducts or chains of SUMO. Um, many SUMO residues are added to this consensus sequence, which is a hydrophobic lysine X uh, glutamate or aspartate, but not all. Um, 
There are a limited number of these E3 enzymes, uh, 4 or 5 in yeast and about 10 in uh, vertebrates. A, a fair number of uh, substrates have been identified, and there is a special class of ubiquitin ligase called stubbles that recognize sumo chains in proteins and add ubiquitin to those proteins. And sumo can be recognized when it's added to proteins through a short motif known as a sumo interacting motif that I'll show you in just a second. Uh, sumolation has many functions in the cell, but perhaps one of the most important functions is in the regulation of transcription, where it's often involved in uh, repression. So this is the structure of, uh, of sumo in the blue here. It is um, very similar to the fold of ubiquitin. Um, and it's recognized by this very short hydrophobic motif with four residues, often flanking acidic residues. And it, it binds into a groove here, completing this um, beta sheet here. So this is a very simple motif by contrast with something like an SH2 domain, which is 120 residues. Um, but there are very well characterized sumo interacting motifs in, in many proteins. We began work on this because of this protein, ring finger 4, RNF4, has a C-terminal ring domain, which uh, acts as an E3 ubiquitin ligase, and an N-terminal array of four sim uh, motifs. And it uses, RNA4 uses these sim motifs to uh, bind polysimulated proteins. Uh, RNA4 family ligases are highly conserved, so sumo targeted ligases, or called stubbles, as I just said. And they ubiquitolate polysimulated targets, um, in particular, PML, the major structural scaffold of nuclear bodies. And RNF4 homologs function primarily, as far as we can tell, in maintaining um, genomic stability. So um, I won't take you through this slide except to point out that one can carry out an assay for um, stubble activity by utilizing a sumo dye GST uh, surrogate substrate, so this is to mimic a sumo chain, and then adding uh, a ubiquitin E1 and E2, and RNF4, either the wild type or the mutant lacking these four sim motifs. And you can see that the wild type generates a ladder of ubiquitated products, whereas the mutant lacking the sims does not. So this is characteristic then of a, a sumo-targeted ubiquitin ligase. And we became interested in um, what arrays of clustered SIMs would do in, uh, in the cell. And you can certainly imagine them recognizing sumo chains, perhaps multi-sumulated proteins, or even complexes where individual subunits are simulated. So Hua Yu San, a postdoc in the lab, decided to look to see how many proteins in the human proteome had clustered SIMs. And so he built a a Python script to search for SIMs of the RNF4 type. Uh, here's what he queried with. By searching 38,000 sequences, he came up with 1,500 with a single match, and 80 of these had two SIMs. And um, the top hit was RNF4, gratifyingly. He added an extra criterion that the uh, predicted SIMs should be able to form a beta strand, because I told you that's how they act, interacted with, uh, with Sumo. And he found about four proteins that had clustered SIMs where he could show that they actually bound Sumo. And I'll tell you briefly now about um, his studies on Arcadia, or RNF111, which is um, another potential stubble. It has a C-terminal ring and a tandem array of three sims. So using that same in vitro assay, he could show that the wild-type Arcadia had stubble activity that was largely lost by mutating the sims. Uh, 
And by analyzing sumo binding of this part of the protein, he could show that um, the sim region bound tetra sumo, and this was largely lost with mutation of sim 3 and completely when you mutated sims 1 and 3. So what does Arcadia do? It um, has been found initially as a mutant mouse, and the mouse, um, uh, homozygous mutant mouse, is an embryonic lethal. And analysis of, of the phenotype, largely by Vasilo Episcopu, showed that these mice are defective in TGF beta signaling and the formation of the node. And so uh, work over the years by several groups has shown that Arcadia potentiates TGF beta receptor signaling. And in that pathway, a heterodimeric receptor serine kinase is activated by TGF beta binding. This phosphorylates um, SMAD2 or SMAD3. These get together with um, the common SMAD, SMAD4, form, four, to form a heterodimer that migrates into the nucleus to drive TGF beta responsive genes. What um, targets might there be for Arcadia in this pathway? There are a number of negative regulators that could be targeted, and there are some other new ones that are, are now emerging. So we wanted to know what sort of genes that are induced by TGF beta are um, Arcadia dependent. And so by RNA seq, Huayu has analyzed wild type and Arcadia null mass embryo fibroblasts, and now more recently, although not shown here, Arcadia reconstituted null uh, MEFs. And he can find uh, sets of genes like these here, which are rapidly induced, so red is high, rapidly induced by TGF beta in wild type cells, but not in mutant cells. And a second class here, which are active, which are induced at one and four hours, but not in, in the mutant cells. So we have categories of genes that are Arcadia dependent. And we'll be using that information. So to study um, how Arcadia might be involved in TGF beta induced gene expression, why you set up a reporter assay in which he uh, expressed, just in 293 cells now, either wild type Arcadia, a, a ring mutant Arcadia, or uh, various other mutant Arcadias, uh, together with um, TGF beta, a, a mutant activated TGF beta R1, so this is TGF beta independent, and a luciferase reporter gene with SMAD re response elements upstream. So we can see a very strong stimulation of um, TGF beta res luciferase response with the Arcadia wild type that's lost with the um, ring cystocea mutant. If we look at the consequences of mutating the sim domains, there's a relatively modest decrease in the stimulation. But if we eliminate this small part of Arcadia, now there's a strong dependence on the sim domains. Um, based on a report that RNF4 could actually reactivate uh, methylated reporter genes, why you also tested that for um, Arcadia. So we used a methylated, a CPG methylated luciferase reporter gene. So this is in vitro methylated. And again, the activated TGF beta R1. And um, just look over here, you can see that uh, both of these internally deleted um, Arcadias are rather dependent on uh, the sumo interacting motif. So lastly then, um, it, we gain some insight for, of, for how Arcadia is working by looking at its nuclear distribution. So if you mildly overexpress a GFP tag form of Arcadia, um, you can see, particularly if we use a, a ring mutant, uh, nuclear dots. What are these dots? Well, there are a variety of nuclear structures that people have uh, identified, including 
PML containing nuclear bodies, um, nuclear speckles, Cajal bodies, and polycomb bodies. And um, there was a modest overlap between um, the Arcadia uh, foci and the PML containing nuclear bodies. There was a little bit of overlap, but not a significant overlap. And instead, what Twayu found was that the Arcadia foci correspond to polycomb bodies, here using um, CBX4 as a component of one of the PRC complexes that localize to polycomb bodies. Um, so there are two um, PRC polycomb repressor complexes. PRC1 reads a trimethyl K27 mark in histone H3 that is generated by a second PRC complex, PRC2. And there's a lot of evidence that uh, polycomb bodies utilize sumoylation as a, uh, an important modification. Sumoylation of CBX4 has been reported to be needed to bind uh, H3K27ME3, and CBX4 itself may have a sumo ligase activity. So then, uh, this is basically the last slide. Um, why you was able to show and just focus really on these two um, panels here, that a truncated flag-tagged Arcadia goes to um, nuclear foci that co-localize with CBX4. But if you mutate the, the SIM motif in this construct, it no longer goes to these um, foci. So, our overall model then is that um, Arcadia, in part, in the nucleus, localizes to polycomb bodies. Uh, probably there are multiple interactions involved. We believe this MC region is critical. There's a, a his, an oligohistidine sequence here, which is important. And we believe the SIMs are important. And so Arcadia is recruited to polycomb bodies in part through simulation dependent mechanisms. And obviously what we're trying to identify is what simulated proteins in polycomb bodies are targeted by Arcadia for ubiquitylation. And our model is then that this um, allows a derepression of targets that will be induced by TGF beta. And for this purpose, we're using ChIP-seq for Arcadia and H3K27ME3 and looking at um, CPG um, methylome data to try and identify target genes that are specifically upregulated through the action of the Arcadia stubble. So with that, I will uh, thank the people who actually did the work. All the work on the phosphistine antibodies was done by uh, Steve Foos, with help from Till Meisenhelder and uh, Aaron Aslanian, I see is missing here, Anna Zagorska and our chemical collaborators. And the work on Arcadia was carried out by uh, Hua Yu Sun. Uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any burning questions. Yes. You are interested in protein modification. That's true. We were interested in post transcriptional or transcriptional. And I'm curious if there exists now a well-described cascade when you, whether there exist well-described cascades when first step is protein modification and that modifies DNA, so new genes are created and that makes more protein. And then you modify protein that again sits, goes into DNA and step by step it's protein, DNA, protein, DNA. Are they a good example of that? Well, I would say there are many signal transduction pathways leading to phosphorylation or acetylation which uh, activates uh, nuclear gene expression. And um, histones are modified post-translationally as a result of these signal transduction pathways that activates the transcription of specific genes, which then produce products that can either feed back and shut down the transcription or feed back and positively enhance 
transcription. So I think, yes, the I, answer is... I wonder, is there a step involved in this DNA modification? Is there modif the DNA uh, modification sequence has the been changed? Not just control. Ah. The sequence is changed, and that causes new protein. And, uh, and then there is second step, DNA sequence change or, or not. The only example I can on and on. <laughs> think of there would be uh, RNA editing, which is under the control of signal transduction pathways. And there you get codon changes, which give, result, give rise to different protein products. But it's not at the DNA level. This is at the RNA level. But no genome change. There's, there's methylation, obviously, of CPGs, but that doesn't alter the coding. Uh, okay. Coding change. No, not that I'm aware of. But yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. That was really fun. Uh, about uh, the polycomb and Arcadia's role in activating from methylated promoters, does it, when it activates expression there, does it leave the DNA methylated or does it demethylate the DNA in association with that activation? That's an excellent question. Obviously, we are considering the possibility that. Um, the TET enzymes might somehow be involved in this process, um, which are, as you know, lead to 5-methyl-C-hydroxylation um, and then subsequent um, uh, demethylation. Obviously, I, I, what we're trying to do is identify genes we think are regulated in this fashion. Then we can go in and look to see whether uh, TGF-beta stimulation causes acute demethylation. And so, we're, yeah, we don't know is the answer, but it's a good idea, yes. Thank you. Yeah, Dave. So, uh, I know it's early days, but have you, do you think that uh, the few histidine proteins that you know to be phosphorylated, do they also fall in these unstructured regions of the protein? Well, um, for certain that's true for histo H4, where histidine 18 is in the N-terminal tail. For the two channels that uh, Ed Skolnick has reported, yes, they're in unstructured C-terminal tails. I think for the beta subunit of G proteins, it's in a, an N-terminal unstructured region. So my guess is yes, although you saw the structure of the two components signaling, and that's in the right. helix. So I don't think right. it necessarily has to be um, in an unstructured region in that case. So I mean, the reason why phosphorylation occurs generally in unstructured regions is that the eukaryotic protein kinase catalytic domain requires an extended peptide backbone to fit into the active site. And so either it has to be unstructured already or it has to be unfolded to fit into the active site. So that doesn't have to be true of all enzymes, though. Uh, you mentioned histone H4S18, is it? Uh, histone uh, histidine, histidine 18. Histidine 18, yes. 18 that is phosphorylated. Yep. Have you mapped this? You're talking about doing chips with Arcadia. Have you mapped this particular phosphorylation across the genome to see if it overlaps with PRC2 or PRC1? I think that would be a very interesting connection between the two halves of my talk. Uh, we have not done that experiment because we do not have those antibodies. My guess is that Tom Muir has done that experiment. Um, I've not heard any outcome, but uh, my guess is that that is being done, right? It's obviously, it would help perhaps tell us something about the function of this rather enigmatic modification. <laughs>